question is, we've been hearing some complaints about late night noise in various dorms, so I just ask you to please be respectful of your fellow dorm mates and realize that noise does carry and we all need our sleep. Um, the other thing is, Amy Williams' uh, sign-up sheets will go out tomorrow morning. She's the final agent to come, so please sign up for those and I will raffle eyes. I've lost words. Um, and let you know who will be meeting with the other agents tomorrow morning. And now for the fun stuff. Raffle time. <laughs> even better than tater time. <laughs> all right, let's see who's going to win all Hot this. dogs, peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa Skapinker. Skapinker? Lisa? Lisa Skip. I'm sorry that I cannot read your handwriting, but Lisa Skip. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll just pick a number. What, wait, what? All right. Um, you spell it. It looks like S-K-A-P-I-N-K-E-R. Hmm. But I'm thinking she's not here since I just spelled her name and she probably... Okay. Trish Woolwine. Elizabeth Spencer, the winner is Margaret De Angelis. Oh, yeah. Or De Angelis. Mm. Margaret. Pick one. <laughs> How about Chris Fats? Fats? How do you pronounce your last name? Fates. Fates. Chris Fates. We have just a few social announcements. There's an open mic at St. Luke's tonight, 9.30. Um, yes, you're right, uh-huh. Um, tomorrow night, there's one at Humphreys. Yes, I will say that um, at 9.30. Both times, um, you've already signed up. You know if you've signed up, you have five minutes to read. We'll have some beer, bring some more. It will be fun. Um, so St. Luke's tonight, Humphreys tomorrow night. Tomorrow at 5.30, there's basketball, and there's lawn games, and Friday night, there will be a creepy nighttime walk in the graveyard with Andrew Hudgens. It's going to be great. We'll tell you more about that tomorrow. Creepy. Please welcome A.E. Stallings. <laughs> Um, it's it's an honor to be here and uh, an honor to be among such excellent company. I'm very grateful. Um, this is a, a triolet um, based on a line apocryphally ascribed to Martin Luther. Why should the devil get all the good tunes, the booze, and the neon, and Saturday night? The swaying in darkness, the lovers like spoons. Why should the devil get all the good tunes? Does he hum them to while away sad afternoons and the long, lonesome Sundays, or sing them for spite? Why should the devil get all the good tunes, the booze, and the neon, and Saturday night? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually my most published poem ever because Poetry Magazine put it on a postcard. It's the one thing of me that will survive. <laughs> um, I hate Sustinas and so do you. <laughs> 
the, the, the problem with cysteine is though, people, people think the problem is you've got those repeated end words. The problem is that it's 39 lines. <laughs> um, and to prove this, um, this, well, you'll, you'll see what's going on here. Um, and, and I stole this idea, you know, but I'm going to give credit where it's due, so that's legitimate. So this is called uh, Sestina Like, with a nod to Jonah Winter for his wonderful Sestina Bob. Now we're all friends. There is no love but like. A semi-demi goddess, something like a reality TV star look-alike named Simile or Me Too. So we like in order to be liked. It isn't like there's love or hate now. Even plain dislike is frowned on. There's no button for it. Like is something you can quantify. Each like you gather is almost something money-like. Token of virtual support. Please like this page to stamp out hunger. <laughs> and you'd like to end hunger and climate change alike. But it's unlikely like does diddly. <laughs> Like just twiddles its unopposing thumbs up. Likewise, props up scarecrow silences. I'm like so over him, I overhear. <laughs> but like, he doesn't get it. Like, you know, he's like, it's all okay. Like, I don't even like him anymore, whatever. <laughs> I'm all like, Take like out of our chat, we'd all alike flounder, agape, gesticulating like a foreign film sans subtitles, fall like dumb phones to mooted desuetude, unlike with other crutches. Um, when we use like, we're not just buying time on credit. Like displaces other words, crowds cuckoo-like, endangered hatchlings from the nest. Click like if you're against extinction. Like is like in Invasive zebra mussels, or it's like those nutria things, or kudzu, or but like redundant fast food franchises, each like more like the next. Those poets who dislike inversions, archaisms, who just like plain English as she spoke, why is it like they're literally every other word? <laughs> I'd like us just to admit that's what real speech is like. But as you like, my friend, yes, we're alike how we pronounce, say, like and dislike <laughs> cancer and war. So like this page, click like. <laughs> Um, that poem was also very kindly taken by Poetry Magazine. And just to show you, I got on such a roll with this that it turned out there was an extra line. <laughs> I had an extra like in there that I had to take out. <laughs> um, I'm going to read some, some older poems. Well, you know, this is from the penultimate book, Hapax, which is Greek for once, once, only, only once. Um, and I, I'm going to read this poem, which I, I don't usually read at readings, but I, I remember reading it at the Scholars' Reading in 1999. <laughs> and I just, I don't know, I want to read it again. Um, so this is called The Village in the Lake, um, and it's about Lake Lanier. It is not a natural lake. It was made for pleasure's sake, for speedboaters and those who swish on water skis. It's stocked with fish. Its waters are not clear, but brown. Every summer, children drown, or teenagers addled with beer and showing off along a pier, push each other in or dive and are not seen again alive. Even sober grown-ups taught in scuba diving can get caught in a submerged tree or vine or tangled in old fishing line. There are those who tell me down at the bottom is a town flooded years and years ago, houses and a Texaco. Somewhere a cemetery lies, how could it be otherwise? Yet I wonder of those dead, all that water overhead who were buried underground. Can ghosts swim or are they drowned, sinking slowly in the mud while in the treetops fishes scud and through the murky heavens floats the shadow of the pleasure boats. Um, uh, and there are other poems, I think, that being in Sewanee kind of um, makes me think of, of 
times when I was growing up, but not terribly, terribly far from here. And um, I guess they, I've been thinking about these poems. This poem is entitled Last Will, um, and it's about, uh, it's about my father's ashes, but it might help that, to know that his name was William or not. I don't know. This, you know, well, I won't explain. What, what he really wanted, she confesses, was to be funneled into shells and shot across a dove field. Only she could not, the kick of shotguns knocks her over. Well, I say, he'd understand. It doesn't matter what becomes of atoms, how they scatter. The priest reads the committal, something short. We drop the little velvet pouch of dust down a cylindrical hole whole board in the clay, and one by one the doves descend, ash gray, softly as cinders on the parking lot, and silence sounds its deafening report. Mm. Arrowhead hunting. The land is full of what was lost. What's hidden rises to the surface after rain in new plowed fields and fields stubbled again, the clay shards foot and lip that heaped the midden, and here and there a blade or flakes of blade, a patient art napped from a core of flint, most broken, few as coins new from the mint, perfect, shot through time as through a glade. You cannot help but think how they were lost. The quarry, fletched shaft in its flank, the blood whose trail soon vanished in the antlered wood. Not just the meat, but what the weapon cost. O oh, hapless hunter, though your aim was true, the spooked heart wounded, fleeting in its fear, and the sharpness honed with longing year by year, buried deeper, found some day, but not by you. There have been a lot of dead animals in the readings. <laughs> it's true. But this one died a very, very long time ago. <laughs> An ancient dog grave unearthed during construction of the Athens metro. And yes, that is Athens, Greece. <laughs> It is not the curled up bones, nor even the grave that stops me, but the blue beads on the collar whose leather has long gone the way of hides, the ones to ward off evil. A careful master even now protects a favorite just so. But what evil could she suffer after death? I picture the loyal companion, bereaved of her master, trotting the long dark way that slopes to the river, nearly trampled by all the nations marching down, one war after another, flood or famine, her paws sucked by the thick caliginous mud, deep as her dew claws near the river bank. In the press for the ferry, who will lift her into the boat? Will she cast under the pier and be forgotten, forever howling and whimpering tail tucked under, what stranger pays her passage? Perhaps she swims, dog paddling the current of oblivion. A shake as she scrambles ashore sets the beads jingling, and then that last tense moment, touching noses once, twice, three times with unleashed Cerberus. I'll read a, a few from the, from the newer book, Olives. Jigsaw Puzzle. First, the four corners, then the flat edges. Assemble the lost borders, walk the dizzy ledges, hoard one color, try to make it all connected, the water and the deep sky and the sky reflected. Absences align and lock shapes into place, and random forms combine to make a tree, a face. Slowly you restore the fractured world and start to recreate an afternoon before it fell apart. Here is summer, here is blue, here two lovers kissing, and here the nothingness shows through where one piece is missing. Mm -hmm. 
burned. You cannot unburn what is burned. Although you scrape the ruined toast, you can't go back. It's time you learned the butter cannot be unchurned. You can't unmail the morning post. You cannot unburn what is burned. The lovers in your youth you spurned. The bridges charred you needed most. You can't go back. It's time you learned smoke's reputation is well earned, not just an acrid, empty boast. You cannot unburn what is burned. You longed for home, but while you yearned, the black ships smoldered on the coast. You can't go back. It's time you learned that even if you had returned, you'd only be a kind of ghost. You can't go back. It's time you learned that what is burned is burned is burned. So I like to say that if you have a marital argument, <laughs> You can write a poem about it. <laughs> and dedicate it to your husband. <laughs> On visiting a borrowed country house in Arcadia for John. <laughs> To leave the city always takes a quarrel. Without warning, rankers that have gathered half the morning like things to pack or a migraine or a cloud are suddenly allowed to strike. They strike the same place twice. We start by straining to be nice, then say something shitty. <laughs> Isn't it funny how it's what has to happen to make the unseen ivory gate swing open, the right we must perform so we can leave? Always we must grieve our botched happiness. We goad each other till we pull to the hard shoulder of the road, yielding to tears inadequate as money. But if instead of turning back, we drive into the day, we forget the things we didn't say. The silence fills with row on row of vines or olive trees. The radio hums to itself. We make our way between Saronic blue and hills of glaucous green and thread beyond the legend of the map through footnote towns along the coast that boast ruins of no account, a column more woebegone than solemn. Men watching soccer at the two cafes and half-built lots where dingy sheep still graze. Climbing into the lap of the mountains now, we wind around blind centrifugal turns. The sun's great warship sinks and burns, and where the roads without a sign are crossed, we inevitably get lost. Yet to be lost here still feels like being somewhere, and we find when we arrive and park, no one minds that we are late. There is no one to wait, only a bed to make, a suitcase to unpack. The earth has turned her back on one yellow middling star to consider lights more various and far. The shaggy mountains hulk into the dark or loom like slow titanic waves, the cries of owls dilate the shadows. Weird harmonics rise from the valley's distant glow where coal extracted from the lignite mines must roll on acres of conveyor belts that sing the Pythagorean music of a string. A huge gray plume of smoke or steam towers like the ghost of a monstrous flame or giant tree among the trees. And it is all the same, the power plant, the forest, and the night, the man-made light. We are engulfed in an immense, ancient indifference that does not sleep or dream. Call it nature if you will, though everything that is, is natural. The lignite bearing earth, the factory, a darkness taller than the sky, this out of doors that wins us our release and temporary peace, not because it is pristine or pretty, but because it has no pity or self-pity. Um, i read a few newer poems. So um, so our daughter is named Atalanta, 
And um, my mother's response when, when we told her that we had named her Atalanta, there was a pause. And what are you going to call her? <laughs> For Atalanta, your name is long and difficult, I know. So many people whom we didn't ask have told us so <laughs> and taken us to task. You too perhaps will wonder as you grow and blame us with the venom of 13 for ruining your life. <laughs> Using our own love against us keen as a double-bladed knife, already I can picture the whole scene. How will we answer you? Yes, you were in a hurry to arrive, as if it were a race to be alive. We weighed, we weighed the syllables and they rang true. And we were hoping, too, you'd come to like the stories of princesses who weren't set on shelves like china figurines. Not allegories, but girls whose glories included rescuing themselves, slaying their own monsters, running free, but not running away. It might be rough, singled out for singularity. Tough. <laughs> Beauty will be of some help, you'll see, but it is not enough to be nimble, brave, or fleet, O oh, apple of my eye. The world will drop many gilded baubles at your feet to break your stride. Don't look down. Don't stoop to scoop them up. Don't stop. Um... So in theory, I'm supposed to be translating Hesiod, the works and days. So of course, in actual fact, I'm reading Herodotus. <laughs> and um, so these are just little vignettes out of Herodotus. Um, this is about the Battle of Plataea, which is a sort of mop-up operation after Thermopylae and so on. Um, but he has a wonderful chapter of description of what happens after the battle. The generals. After the blood-brimmed field, we were amazed to stride into those empty silken tents, bright tapestries, wrought silver, ornaments, the furnishings of solid gold. Eyes glazed at all the untold booty, gods be praised. Our king bid foreign cooks spare no expense to make the meal our foes would eat, prepare their pastries, spices, wine. Such slowly braised flesh melting off the bone, such colors, scents. Our king laughed as he laid out on the cloth beside the feast our ration of black broth. Behold, they came to rob us of our fare. We also laughed, though fed up with that food, the soldier's mess, the black broth of blood. The concubines. We heard the Greeks had won. At once I went and decked myself with every bracelet, ring, gold necklace that I owned and rouged my cheeks and hastily had my maids arranged my hair. The other concubines slumped in despair, but I'd been snatched from Kos, my people Greeks. Dressed in white robes of silk, we fled the tent and drove through corpses as far as the eye could see until I saw Pausanias, the king. I stepped with golden sandals through the gore, the lady that I was and not the whore and knelt a supplicant, please set me free. The roar of blood like silence in my ear until, lady, arise, be of good cheer. Lamp on the Egonite. Your glory after this victory is sealed, I told Pausanias to please him. Now crown it with revenge for Leonidas beheaded at Thermopylae. Remember the restitution that Xerxes denied us and how he said Mardonius would pay it? Well, here is the cadaver. You just say it and we'll impale Mardonius' head. He stood in silence as his face went somber. Stranger, he addressed me, on this field the crime was well avenged. As for that corpse, who knows what happened to it? There are versions. The truth is not so straight, it never warps. Someone interred it, so I've heard it said, and reaped a handsome bounty from the Persians. The Immortals. This is in the voice of the Persians. He called us the immortals, the select companions who would battle at his side, Mardonius on his white charger. Pride we felt, of course. Maybe we half believed we were that day, not helmeted or grieved, no golden scales under the robes we wore. We wielded wicker shields for catching arrows. 
We were surrounded, as on mountain hunts, a pack of Spartan hounds surrounds the boar. In that tight space, we knew our hopes were wrecked, like ships, frail bridges over Hellespont's, the horse-whipped waters bridling at the narrows. We were caught up in doom, like fish or sparrows, grateful as other men to die but once. And this is Aristodemus the coward, who is the, the lone survivor of Thermopylae. I lie here without honor as I willed. Alone among those at Thermopylae I lived, if it is life to loathe each breath. They say I was the bravest Spartan here, but that I broke formation, and I fought not only as one not afraid of death, but one who seeks it, battle mad, distraught. A Spartan soldier never leaves the line. It took so many Persians to get killed, I slogged on, drunk with slaughter as with wine. And when at last I met the foeman's, the foeman's spear, I lay my body down like shame, now free to fall amidst the dust, having fulfilled the ranks of the 299. Let's see. The stain remembers your embarrassment, wine or blood, sweat or oil. When the ink leaked your intent because you thought truth couldn't soil, or when you let the secret slip, or when you dropped the leaden hint, or when between the cup and lip the Beaujolais pled innocent, or when the rumor's fleet was launched, or when the sheets waged their surrender, but the breach could not be staunched and no apology would tender. When overserved, you misconstrued and blurbed your heart sick on your sleeve. When everything became imbued with sadness, yet you couldn't grieve. Inalienable as DNA, self-evident as fingerprints, it will not out, although you spray and pre-soak in the sink and rinse. What they suspect, the stain will know. The stain records what you forget. If you wear it, it will show. If you wash it, it will set. <laughs> Another marital argument. <laughs> <laughs> Spring cleaning. This has a little bit to do with Hesiod, so. <laughs> the washing machine door broke. We hand washed for a week. Left in the tub to soak, the angers began to reek. And sometimes when we spoke, you, sh you said we shouldn't speak. Pandora was a bride. The gods gave her a jar but said, don't look inside. You know the myth so far. Curiosity denied, that's not how stories are. Whatever the gods forbid, it's sure someone will do. She lifted the jar's lid and may the worst come true. Of course she lifted the lid and out all trouble flew. Sickness, war, and pain, nerves frayed like fraying rope. Every bale and bane with which mankind must cope. The only thing to remain lodged in the mouth was hope. Or so the tale asserts. And who am I to deny it? Yes, out like black-winged birds, the woes flew and ran riot. But I say that the woes were words, and the only thing left was quiet. Um, Jill McCorkle, uh, I think it was during the craft lecture, um, had this wonderful thing. She was talking about transitional objects. So a transitional object, it's your teddy bear, it's your security blanket, it's that object that, um, as a child, you give the power to comfort you. Um, and I, so this is a, in the voice of the transitional object. <laughs> I am the first thing that she named, and the lisp stuck. Though now I'm maimed, half-blinded, stained, thumbed to a shred by love's attrition. I who tamed the nightmare coiled beneath the bed, and foiled the fever in the head, and sopped up leaks of snot and tears. At night, she reached for me instead of arms to lullaby her fears. And yet my obsolescence nears. Plush is not so thick or deep. It is not balded by the years. 
She wants me still, though, and will weep unless I guard the gates of sleep, granting her passage through the dark, and I'm the vigil that you keep. Left in a taxi, dropped at the park, such worries haunt you, comic, stark, the ways that I may be might be mislaid and the heart heal, but leave a mark. Once she misplaced me, how you prayed, she was distressed, but you afraid, to lose her first not needing you, the comfort she both took and made. Um, so, my mother brought me a cast iron skillet in her carry-on <laughs> on the plane. Why that wasn't taken away as a potential weapon, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, tweezers, whatever, but you could hijack a plane with a cast iron skill. Um, and my, so, but the great problem with this is I have to constantly hide it because people wash it. <laughs> cast irony. <laughs> Who scrubbed this iron skillet? <laughs> <laughs> Who scrubbed this? <laughs> Sorry, okay. Third time. <laughs> Who scrubbed this iron skillet <laughs> in water with surfactant soap? <laughs> Meant to cleanse, not kill it. <laughs> but since its black and lustrous skin, despoiled of its enrobing oils, dulled, lets water in. Now it is vulnerable and porous, as a hero stripped of his arms before a scornful chorus. It lacks internal consistency as ancient oral epics, where a Bronze Age warrior might appeal to a boar's tusk helmet-wearing foe, foe who has an anachronistic heart of steel, will of iron, from which metals no one has yet forged a weapon, much less pans or kettles. Though there must have been between two eras awkward overlap enacted in the kitchen when mother-in-law and daughter wrangled over the newfangled over oil and water in proverbial mistrust, brazen youth subject to iron age as iron is to rust. There can be no reasoning with sarcastic oxygen. Only a reseasoning can give the vessel's life new lease. Scour off the scab the color of dried blood. Apply some elbow grease to make it fast. Anoint it. Put it once more in the fire where everything is cast. Elegy. The finery of childhood, let them wear it every day, in rain or shine. Don't lose your temper over patent leather shoes, mud puddle deep, or fret for Easter frocks, hand smocked that meet with chocolate or paint. Let Sunday best be must, new trousers tear, elbows of pure wool cardigans be rent. Let silken ribbons stray, mismatch lace socks. Let grape juice stain. For someday comes to call and finds the garment now too tight, too small, outmoded, out of season, itchy, quaint, stored up in lavender and mothballs. Let joy sport its raiment while still bright and loose. Let what cannot be saved or spared be spent. It's fitting. What is theirs is not your own. The finery they did not spoil with use that lies in drawers, unblemished and outgrown. The last carousel. The horses have seen better days go by. 
with the one eye that peers out on the orbiting world. The other eye has always looked inward to where the moving parts are hidden by a column of gilt-edged, tarnished mirrors. Why are we pierced through the hearts by their poles of polished brass, mismatched orphans, some antique carved of solid wood, some factory molded fiberglass? They course counterclockwise, round and round, while time holds them at arm's length. Their feet are shod but never touch the ground. They've known the shake of reins, bidding them race, the heels that drum their flanks, urging them faster and faster in one place, the laughter and the outside voices calling, the tinned music stuttering in its rut, the last seasick tide rising or falling. Their gallop is a wave that seizes. In their rhythmic progression, they are cousins to the horses on stolen marble friezes in bas relief in some far off museum that once was prinked with paint. But now that I see them, waiting patiently beneath the hive of garish light as one giddy generation mounts and another sulks into the night, one last go, it isn't fair. I am moved by the pivot of their stillness, by their ragged comet tails of genuine horsehair. I'm going to read briefly from a translation and then two very short poems. Um, so uh, I translated into rhymed heptameters. <laughs> Um, the 7,000 odd lines of Lucretius's um, The Nature of Things, which is a wonderful didactic poem full of lyric moments and even better yet, rants. Um, it is partly, uh, it's an explanation of the Epicurean theory, which is about um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And one of the things that the Epicureans believed was that while friendship promoted happiness, um, love did not. <laughs> not romantic love. Um, so, let me find this. Where is my passage? Um, and the idea being that, you know, this just sort of made you miserable. I think he's probably also getting a dig in at his possible acquaintance, Catullus, who is uh, quite miserable. I mean, in a way, this is playing off of Latin love elegy. It's, it sort of embodies all the cliches. So it's a rant. Um, his uh, presumed audience, I guess, is probably male. Um, so it seems a little bit misogynistic. Um, and... Uh, you'll hear a lot of um, place names, and you could think of these almost as brand names, like Gucci and Louis Vuitton or whatever. Um, so I'll just start mid-rant. And this is also, it was translated uh, by Moliere, um, and then translated by Richie Wilbur, so it has a, it's a wonderful um, passage that goes through literature. This is my version. I may, I may prefer Wilbur's, <laughs> but that's a translation of Moliere. <laughs> Add this. Lovers fritter away their strength, worn out in thrall. This also. One lives ever at the other's beck and call. They grow slack in their duties. Good name stumbles and malingers. Wealth turned to Babylonian perfumes slips through the fingers. But you can bet that she's well healed in shoes from Sicyon. And those are genuine emeralds, the rocks that she's got on. The wine dark sheets from rough and constant use upon the bed and drinking up the sweat of Venus are worn down to the thread. The father's hard-earned fortune turns to tiaras for her hair, a linden silks, diaphanous gowns from Kos for her to wear. He shells out for fantastic feasts with all the trimmings. Fine linens, music, perfume, garlands, wreaths, free-flowing wine, but in vain, since in the very fountain of delights there rises something of bitterness that chokes even among the roses. Perhaps it's that remorse, gnawing at the conscience, taunts the lover he's thrown his life away in sloth among low haunts, or else his darling wings a two-edged word at him, a dart that smolders like a fire and rankles in the love-struck heart, or else he thinks her roving eye too freely wanders after another and imagines in her face a trace of laughter. 
And these are just the problems of a love that's going well. <laughs> Imagine a love that's crossed and doesn't have a chance in hell. Even with your eyes shut, you can grasp that the amount of troubles in unhappy love are more than you could count. It's best to keep eyes open. As I've said, don't take the bait. It's easier to avoid the toils of love than extricate yourself once you are caught fast in the nets and to break free from the strong knots of Venus. Yet you're still able to flee the danger, even if you're tangled up, snared in the gin, so long as you don't stand in your own way and don't begin to overlook all shortcomings in body and in mind of the woman you left lust after for desire makes men blind and generally they overlook their girlfriend's faults and bless these women with fine qualities they don't in fact possess <laughs> that's how it comes that we see girls malformed in many ways and hideous our petted darlings, objects of high praise. Indeed, one lover often urges another he would mock. Venus has it out for you. Your love's a laughing stock. Poor fool that his delusions worse would come as quite a shock. The black girl is brown sugar. A slob that doesn't bathe or clean is a natural beauty. <laughs> Athena, if her eyes are grayish green. A stringy bean pole's a gazelle. A midget is a sprite, cute as a button. She's a knockout if she's giant's height. The speech impaired has a charming lisp. If she can't tack at all, she's shy. The sharp-tongued shrew is spunky, a little fireball. If she's too skin and bones to live, she's a slip of a girl. If she is sickly, she's just delicate, though half dead from TB. Obese with massive breasts, a goddess of fertility. Snub-nosed is pert, fat lips are pouts begging to be kissed, and other delusions of this kind too numerous to list. Yet even if her face has every beauty you could name and she pours out the power of Venus from her entire frame, the truth is there are other fish in the sea. <laughs> Um, so I, I drafted this poem actually uh, last year at the conference, so I feel I should read it here. And um, it was inspired um, uh, by going to the Monteagle Crafts Fair and watching the blacksmithing demonstration, which we did two days in a row because my son became obsessed with it. And we went back this year. So, the rose head nail. But can you forge a nail? The blonde boy asks. And the blacksmith shoves a length of iron rod deep in the coal fire cherished by the bellows until it glows volcanic. He was a god before anachronism, before the tasks that had been craft were jobbed out to machine. By dint of hammer song, he makes his keen raw point and crowns utility with rose, quincunks of facets peddling its head. The breeze made visible sidewinds. The boy's blonde mother shifts and coughs. Once work was wed to loveliness. Sweat-faced, swarthy from soot, he reminds us with the old saw he employs and doesn't miss a beat, smoke follows beauty. Um, I'd like to close. Uh, a, lot of a lot of poets of my generation are dead. Um, which, I, which I know will happen more and more as, as one gets older, but it does seem kind of premature. And um, wonderful people that I think about and miss, um, we think of um, Will Mills, um, Rachel Whetstone, Sarah Hanna, Craig Arnold, um, Jake Adam York. I, and I wanted to read something, I've been thinking about some of these people and, and sort of missing them. And uh, so this is, it's, it's actually a poem by Callimachus. Um, but it's one of these rare cases when the translation is a poem in its own right. And it's a famous uh, Victorian translation by I think William Corey. Um, so this is kind of in honor of, of people that I've been missing. They told me, Heraclitus, they told me you were dead. They brought me bitter news to hear and bitter tears to shed. I wept as I remembered how often you and I had tired the sun with talking and sent him down the sky. 
And now that thou art lying, my dear old carrion guest, a handful of dry ashes long, long ago at rest, still are thy pleasant voices, thy nightingales awake. For death he taketh all away, but them he cannot take. Thank you.